Mark 1. Conversations at the speed of sound. Hello and welcome to this episode of Mac One, the podcast of the Queensland Air Museum Caloundra. My name is Gary Hills, I'm a QAM volunteer, and I'll be your host for this second part of a two-part episode focusing on the Shorts Empire flying boats of the 1930s and 40s, and particularly in this episode, the story of the six Empire flying boats operated by Qantas, Now, we're doing something a little bit different in this episode. We're value-adding, if you like, with some uh, visuals. So if you're listening to this in the normal way of listening to a podcast, that's fine. You won't notice any difference. If you'd like to see images of Paul and myself as we speak, as well as photographs of the Empire flying boats that he's describing, you can go to the Queensland Air Museum YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and type in Queensland Air Museum in the search bar. When that comes up, go to videos, and you'll find all of our videos from the Air Museum, and you'll find there this episode about the Empire Flying Boats. A little bit of an experiment. Um, Let us know what you think. Uh, We could do more episodes like this in the future where we feature images as well as voice. But just for now, this is uh, the recording that I made with Paul from his home about the Qantas Empire flying boats. Welcome back, Paul. It's good to talk to you again. Thank you for all of that information you gave us in the first episode where we we did a a very quick potted history of the uh, short uh, brothers and their uh, aircraft production. We, We talked about flying boats in general and about the Empire Flying Boat in particular. We talked about some of its history and and what it did up until World War II. Uh, And then we sort of left off there because I wanted to then focus in on the Qantas story, uh, Qantas Imperial uh, story of the the Empire Flying Boats. So how about uh, we, we, we begin by just talking about each of the six flying boats and we can put them in alphabetical order according to their their uh, registration numbers, if if you like. And let's let's uh, we'll show our listeners uh, images as we go of these uh, aircraft. And if you give us a quick history of each one, what it, what it did and what became of it, that would be the most interesting sure. thing. So what's our first aircraft? Is it the Carpentaria? Carpentaria VHABA. And she was the 26th Empire flying boat that was launched, uh, launched on the 23rd of November 1937. It was allocated a British registration as each of the the aircraft were. Uh, However, there is only photographic um, proof that one was ever um, carried that registration on its fuselage before they were delivered to Qantas, and that was Kuji. Um, However, they operated... uh, they use the registration as their call sign, but they had the Australian registrations painted on the sides of the aircraft. So uh, she came into service then on the um, 5th to the 10th of December 1937. She operated her first big service out to Karachi as uh, flight number IE 607. Uh, it was then delivered to Qantas on the 26th of July 1938 as uh, it went out as a server, uh, as a commercial service, IE 671 to Australia, and it was taken over as soon as it arrived in Australia. An interesting thing about it, it came off the British register in June of 1938, and it didn't go on to the Australian register until the 13th of September 38. So that means for those three months, it operated without being a registered aircraft. So I don't quite know how they got away with that, but they did. And I see Um, in the photographs of it that it's Qantas Empire Airways Brisbane. Correct. Qantas's head office was in Brisbane until May May or June of 1938. Mm. So uh, they, when they came off the the uh, slipway when they were launched, that that information was already painted on the fuselages. It quickly got changed once they got over here. So, and they did um, operate off the Brisbane River. Yes, they did. Yeah, from the Hamilton Reach. Yeah. Yes, and then. Um, 
in in on the 15th of February 42, Carpenteria happened to be in Durban. It had it had gone across on the uh, the horseshoe route, which operated to Durban during the the early war years, and it was already over there when Singapore fell. So it got stuck on that side. It then reverted to its British registration based in Durban, and it operated continued on the horseshoe route but of course at that stage the horseshoe route was pulled back to a terminus at Calcutta which was later even moved further west to Karachi so it never came back to Australia after that time but it did go on it was one of the surviving aircraft that went right till the end it operated its last service from um from Cairo down to Durban uh, in the last week of December 47 and then 14th to the 19th of January 47 it was positioned back to Poole in the UK and on to Hythe and then it was taken uh, towed to a place called Marchwood on Southampton Water where it was broken up by RJ Coley and Son for scrap metal they, I believe they got something like five tons of scrap metal off, off each aircraft. Mm. It had done a total of 14,989 flying hours at that time. And uh, she was broken up early in uh, 1947, 1948, sorry. And um, no, 1947. 1947, and uh, one of 13 that survived uh, from the Durban base. And of course, after the war, they were all broken up. Is that right? Where there are none in existence anymore? Well, there were still a few. Uh, Coriolanus went on from here till uh, December of 1948, I, I think. Yeah. Yeah, 48. 48. Uh, the Aotearoa in New Zealand, of course, had lasted until October 50, even though it wasn't flying. It was a, as a static uh, display, but they were really the last two that, that, that were in, mm. in um, existence. Sad, because two of, the, two of the British ones were offered to museums, and Coriolanus, the, one that he, the last one that Qantas had, uh, one of Qantas's employees uh, wanted to purchase it and preserve it, and uh, Hudson Fish was not having any of that, and he said, no, it was going to be broken up. And likewise, the one that was on display in New Zealand for two years, uh, it, it, nobody wanted it. They didn't treasure the, you know, how we would think today, Indeed. we would grab it with both hands, you know, Indeed. and have it on display somewhere. Well, in those post-war years, there was an awful lot of other things that were more important to worry about, I suppose. And, uh, you know, there was no no compulsion to do that. We have a number of aircraft, just a few at the Queensland Air Museum that are full-scale replicas. And uh, yes, it would be a challenge, I imagine, to build a full-scale Empire flying boat replica. Has anybody attempted it, to your knowledge? Not that I know of, but I have heard of a man who thinks he's going to do it. So he's in New Zealand, but um, I'm not sure. Okay. I don't know whether it'll ever have very no, expensive right. exercise. Oh, um, un undoubtedly. Okay, so that's ABA, Carpenteria. Next one up was Coolangatta, VHABB, and she was launched on uh, 10th of December, 1937. Qantas wanted to have, uh, they were called the C-Class, that had been established by Imperial Airways, and Qantas wanted to have one, uh, an aircraft, each aircraft to be representative of a town in a different, in a different state of Australia, and that's how they got their names. Uh, she went, was originally going to be registered AF, GAFBK to Imperial Airways, but that never happened. It came down here to, and was delivered to, it was actually the first one delivered to um, Qantas. It was delivered on the 2nd of April, 1938, after operating out uh, from Karachi in Singapore. 
and it 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 almost um, missed its uh, um, uh, delivery because to, on the right day because it broke down on the way, but <laughs> he got there in, in time. Um, it was withdrawn from service in 1940, uh, uh, operated a redistribution flight from Singapore to Sydney, and on the 29th of June, it was, it, it was chartered to the RAAF. So off she went to the RAAF and uh, she was registered then A18-13 and allocated to number 11 squadron of the RAAF. Uh, she carried a call sign VHCRB when she was in use with the uh, RAAF and she moved a couple of times onto 33 squadron and onto 41 squadron. Uh, they withdrew it from service in um, 13th of July 1943 and it went back to Qantas at that time. Um, it was then used for some um, work that Qantas were doing on behalf of uh, ANA, the, the big airline that was here in Australia, that, and that they, they came to an arrangement where they would share aircraft operating to Townsville and back to Sydney and sometimes on to Darwin and back to Sydney. And, uh, and Coolangatta uh, was one of those that did that. On the 11th of October 1944, when it was alighting at Sydney, uh, the, the uh, planing hull broke up when it hit the water and it had actually broken half and, and sank. Um, they managed to salvage both parts of the aircraft and brought them up. Uh, I just haven't, there was some loss of life on that aircraft. I can't remember the details, I'm sorry on that. Anyway, it was cancelled from the Australian Register in October 1944 and she had done 11,069 hours flying in, during her life. Okay. So we'll move on. Yes. Number three. ABC. ABC Kunji. Yep. Okay. Kunji was uh, the 28th Empire flying boat built. Um, I've got to add in here as well to when, when war started, they started realising that the the um, range of the aircraft created a lot of problems for them. And so Qantas had a company called Muller and Co in Sydney who built new fuel tanks for them, three tanks of 200 gallons each, and they were fitted into the top of the upper deck of the flying boats and it doubled the range. So they went from 700 odd to nearly 1500 miles range. So, Kuji was uh, launched on the 1st of January 1938 and it delivered to Imperial Airways at that stage, during which time it, this, it had its uh, registration changed to its British registration at that time, and we have photographic evidence of that. On the 7th of June 1940, after operating a Karachi Sydney service, it was withdrawn from use by Qantas and chartered again to the RAAF as A1812 from the 8th of June 1940. And unfortunately, this aircraft uh, crashed while alighting at Townsville on the 27th of February 1942. It was doing a local test flight. It had some unauthorized people on the aircraft, and um, two of those lost their lives. Now, that was going to uh, number so, 11 squadron as well, was it? Uh, yes, it went to, yes, number 11 squadron. Mm -hmm. So it only, sh it only operated with them for a very short time because it, it, uh, it was June 40 and February 42, so 18 months and it was gone. Mm. Okay. Badly. Uh, number four was um, ABD Corio. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Um, Corio was the 29th Empire flying boat um, built. Uh, she was a standard S23 uh, Mark I aircraft. 
British registration G A E U H, which it never carried as we as far as we know. Also, the aircraft, all of them were operate were allocated a fleet number, and all of the um, records of that aircraft it was referred to as number twenty nine. Everyone had a different number. So it was launched at Rochester, 2nd of February, 1938, with its Australian registration painted on it. And, <clears throat> excuse me, it was um, answered from the UK register on 13th of June, 38, and delivered to Qantas on the 18th of October, 38, onto the Australian register the 19th of October. So again, an aircraft that was unregistered for a number of months. Uh, it was withdrawn from Qantas uh, on, on the 17th of October 1939, and it was exchanged for GADUT Centaurus, which happened to be down here, and that aircraft was on the uh, on the other side. So um, it uh, went to to back to Imperial Airways. It came through to Australia in 1942 but it crashed after being shot down by enemy action near Koh Phang. It was on a Darwin to Koh Phang service on the 30th of January, 1942, and uh, the aircraft was lost. It had relatively small hours on it, 5,873 hours. Mm. All right, so we're moving on to the Kurong. <clears throat> Kurong. Kurong was a sad aircraft. She had a, she, she had a very difficult life. Um, she had a number of um, little accidents. She was number 30th Empire boat uh, launched, and she was launched on the 24th of February 1938 with VHABE painted on it. And uh, she was cancelled from the UK register on the 19th of August 38 and delivered to Qantas on the 6th of September. And she had operated out uh, as flight SE14. They changed the flight numbers coming out. Um, uh, at, at that time, uh, SE and SW were the flights into Sydney and out of Sydney. So it was Sydney eastbound and Sydney westbound, and so it came in under the new the new um, designators that they brought into play. Um, she was severely damaged after being blown ashore during a storm in Darwin on the evening of the twelfth of December, nineteen thirty eight. Uh, there are photographs that you've no doubt seen of it where it's actually sitting up on a rock uh, seawall. It just got completely blown out of the water almost. A lot of damage done to it, but it was um, uh, salvaged and it was shipped back to Rochester for a complete build. And it was the only one that uh, Rochester ever rebuilt. They said it took too much time and too much money, and they were by that stage starting to build the Sunderlands with war looming and so on. And they just they just lost all interest in being in being able mm. to repair them. So, um, so once it was relaunched on the tenth of November, nineteen thirty nine, back in Rochester, it was agreed that Kurong would then join the fleet of Imperial Airways, and. BIC kept one of theirs in in return, so that happened. Uh, it went on to um, South Africa uh, to a base in Durban, and it was one of the survivors right till the end, uh, proceeding back to Pool in England on the 10th of February 1937, and off to uh, Marchwood to be broken up with 12,472 hours on the clock. <clears throat> One thing I must add with Kurong, she, during its period of service, it had a, a mishap in that it was supposed to be going into Rome and Rome was fogged in. So it went diverted and went to Naples and the nobody had thought to tell Imperial Airways or BOAC that um, the Italian Navy was doing some manoeuvres with submarines in the harbour at, at uh, Naples, and uh, the submarine collided with Kurong and was very badly damaged. One of the wings had to be replaced, and so it was grounded for some months in, in Italy while it was all fixed. 
fortunately, it was before the, Italy came into the war, so there wasn't an issue with the with the aircraft. So a rather unlucky so, aircraft, but the only yes. one to be rebuilt and given a new life. And I think and you said survived, and survived. Survived the war. Right at the end. Yes, yeah. indeed. So broken yeah. up in 1947. What a story. That's right. And then and the last um, one, ABF. ABF uh, Kui. Um, yes, she was uh, the 31st Empire boat built. And she was launched at, uh, onto the Midway River on the 28th of March, 1938. Cancelled from the US, uh, UK register in March. No actual data is showing on the UK register on that. That was delivered to Qantas on the 1st of May, 1938. And it uh, was stranded in England on the 10th of June, 1948 after operating a service number CW from 224 from Alexandria to Poole. Now, CW was Calcutta westbound. So that, that had gone in from Calcutta and was caught on that side because the Mediterranean was closed down. So on the 26th to the, of September to the 16th of October 1940, it was ferried from Poole to Durban, and wait for this, it went via Lisbon, Las Palmas, Bathurst, Freetown to Lagos, and then to a lovely little place on the on the Uganda River called Banana, Leopoldville, Stanleyville, Kasumu, Mozambique to Durban, and joined the fleet down there to operate on the horseshoe routes back to Sydney. <laughs> so it was withdrawn from use on the 14th of February 1942 when it arrived in as service number WS160 from at Sydney. Uh, so it was back on the eastern side um, uh, when Singapore fell. And so it was back into the fleet. Um, but it was stranded, so it was transferred to, sorry, it was stranded on the other side. And so it, it was uh, transferred to BOAC at Durban base and uh, and it didn't come back into Sydney. Sorry, I'm reading the wrong line. So um, yes, so she became one of the last ones also to survive, withdrawn by BOAC in 19, uh, Jan January the 11th, 1947, after operating from Cairo down to Durban as flight 44E27. She was positioned then back to Paul between the 29th of January and 2nd of February 47, and canceled from the register on the 7th of March 47, broken up by Coley's at Marchwood with 14,307 hours on the clock. So that was the basic first six aircraft. Okay, and that's their, their fates. Um... I have a very large, beautiful painting of the uh, uh, and Gatta, by the way, taking off uh, from the water in the uh, QAM studio, which I'm very happy about. It belongs to the museum. It's not mine personally, yes. but it's it's a beautiful, beautiful sight. Um, and look, uh, I know that my, my initial contact with you, Paul, was from uh, another QAM volunteer, Ian Campbell, who yes. is currently researching a uh, the definitive biography of Don Bennett. Air Vice Marshal yes. Bennett, and I know that there's an overlap between the Bennett story and the Empire flying boats. Just briefly, what is that connection? Okay, well, Don Bennett joined uh, Imperial Airways in 1936 and was very quickly promoted to a captain on board. And the captains were actually allocated an, an, an aircraft, which was their, their baby, if you like, and he was allocated the aircraft uh, Cassiopeia, which was one of the Imperial Airlines fleet. And he operated on that for a little while, but he became very interested in the short uh, Mayo composite, which was the an aircraft that was kind of like an Empire flying boat named Maya. And it, it was fitted out with a, a gantry on top of it that carried a small seaplane. And Don Bennett became fascinated with this seaplane and what could be done with it. 
and he actually ended up flying that aircraft uh, off the top of Maya. They, they'd take off together, and at, at the right moment, they would a signal would pass between the two aircraft. They would be released, and and off off the little one would go. And Don Bennett took it over to uh, from Foynes through Botwood to Montreal, and then he came back without it being lifted and coming un under its own um, uh, means. It took off from Montreal, mm -hmm. went to Bermuda, down to Horta and the Azores, and then across to Lisbon and back up to Foynes and back to Poole. And he operated that. He then operated it. He was trying to set a world record for a seaplane operation. And he took it, uh, they took it up to uh, Dundee and it was lifted off by Maya from Dundee. And 42 hours later, they landed on, at the mouth of the Orange River in what is now uh, Namibia on the west coast of Africa. Mm. Uh, he set a world record for flying over 6,000 miles nonstop in 42 hours. And he had plans for other long haul operations that he wanted to try as well, but they didn't come to anything. He wanted to operate one from uh, from South Africa to Perth, but that didn't happen. Okay, so that well, was really... We, we're looking forward to uh, Ian's work when it's completed because uh, it's, it's a fascinating... Be it is the definitive study it of this be. man. I know he speaks very highly of you and of the contribution you made to his that section of his research about Don Bennett's life. We're going to say thank you right now, and I'm going to invite our listeners to look out for Empire to the Antipodes, hopefully later in 2023. We wish you all the very best with that, and I'll be certainly lining up for one if, uh, if I can see that it becomes available soon. Uh, it's been fascinating to talk to you. Thank you so much for your your generosity i mean the kind of work that you have had to put in over how many years has it been in this this project well i really started it five years ago i, I had I, I just couldn't believe that these records didn't survive somehow well thank thank you for what you've done though because somebody has to put in the time and the effort and and uh, make this kind of a project happen and over as you say over five years so we're looking forward to being able to obtain that we thank you very much for talking to us today because this has been a fascinating little snapshot for me into this golden era of the flying boats uh, in commercial aviation in the 1930s just that short window of time where they were in their glory and uh, it's been amazing so so Paul Sheehan thank you very much for talking to us thanks Gary it's been a pleasure thank you very much so that's our episode. Thank you for listening. And thank you again to Paul Sheehan, very generous with his time. And I am looking forward to buying that book of his when it comes out uh, by Empire to the Antipodes. Next week, we have uh, a special episode in honour of the 80th anniversary of the Dam Busters raid. Now, one of the crews in that raid on uh, P for Popsy, the third aircraft in, uh, was uh, manned by Mickey Martin, an Australian, and the tail gunner on that uh, aircraft also was an Australian by the name of Tommy Simpson, and I'll be speaking with his daughter, who now lives in Hobart, about uh, her dad and his life and his career, and we'll just have a bit of a feature on P for Popsy and on the Dam Busters raid on the 80th anniversary of that event. So thank you for listening today. If you'd like to meet us, we'd love to meet you. So come on into the Queensland Air Museum, 7 Pathfinder Drive, Caloundra, anytime between 10am and 4pm every day of the year, except Christmas Day and Good Friday. We would love to meet you. Come and see us soon. Bye for now. <laughs>